Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're looking at a relook at a original video I did on the BRN180. Now back in SHOT Show 2017, Brownells introduced their retro line. And I have to say, if anything I saw at SHOT Show that year, the thing that really most had me floored was the introduction of their retro series, especially the BRN10. Nobody in history, you know, in, in history since the uh, 1950s has ever done a retro AR-10, and I mean a real AR-10 that was the original configuration that was done by Armalite in the late 50s. And uh, the fact that Brownells did it uh, was an incredible undertaking. And it was an original undertaking because you're looking at receivers that were not based off of anything that had been done before. You were basically recreating an obsolete components uh, from scratch, but you're also having to do it with sort of a modern tone. Uh, basically what we see here is the original look, but there were modifications made to make it compatible with the current generations of AR-10s that were out there. So on the higher levels of barrels and bolts and bolt carriers, you'd be able to utilize spare components. Now, the original video we did was probably in January or February of 2017. The initial rifle we had was the one you see here. This is my personal BRN-10A, uh, which is based off of the original one, which had the brown furniture. And this was, uh, without a doubt, the most popular of all of them. Now, as some of you may or may not know, the AR-10 patents uh, was sold along with the AR-15 patent to Colt. And Colt had both prints uh, during the initial phases of the uh, of sales uh, and, and, and marketing that was going on, you had a couple of guys who were traveling around the world and they were demonstrating both the AR-10 and the AR-15 at that time. Colt was gearing up for production of both. Well, at that point, Bobby McDonald said that there was absolutely no interest in the AR-10 and to gear up for the AR-15. And then the AR-10 design went all off into obscurity right up until the introduction of the SR-25. However, at that same time, Mark Westrom and Armalite was doing his rebirth of the AR-10 as well. But it was not, again, the same as you see here. It was it was different. It was a more of a modern M16A2 look at it. But the first successful AR-10 wouldn't be until uh, Gene Stoner went back to work with Reed Knight. Uh, and that was the first thing he recreated was his SR-25, which was a modernized version of his AR-10, which had compat parts compatibility with the M16A2. So looking at the rifle here, we're going to take a close look at some of the the really interesting and cool features that they had here. Brownells came up with an entire uh, retro series of furniture. So you had the original M16A1 original stocks, which had the sling swivel, which is what the same thing they used on the AR-10. Now the upper and lower receivers are very, very interesting because the actual dimensions were taking off an original uh, A&I AR-10 upper and lower receiver. Everything was again scaled down so it would be you know close to the modernized SR25 type, which you see SR25 type pattern, but they kept with the, the look. The carrying handle, the exact same size. We see our top charging handle on here. The lower receiver we see here, although it's compatible with the SR25 AR10 type, it was quite different. If you were to see the lengthy magazine well, which utilized on the original AR10. Now this magazine well will not accept anything but steel or aluminum magazines, so we'll not take any of the polymer magazines, uh, anything that has any kind of a magazine overstop on it. So uh, the magazines which we're going to get to in a few minutes. Now one of the main things that was changed uh, since the introduction was the pistol grip. The, the rifles originally came with standard M16A1 retro pistol grips. Brownells had gone ahead and modified and made a original AR-10 type pistol grip, which really added a lot to it. There's been two major changes that have taken place uh, since the adoption of this rifle. And it was the pistol grip and it was the addition of a heat shield uh, inside of the handguard because this thing got quite hot without a heat shield in it. And we're going to take, take a look at that in a few minutes. But looking on the right side, we see the top charging handle. The top charging handle was probably the only uh, really complaint that I had when I first got this because the, utilizing the steel clip in the back, the steel spring clip in the back, this was extremely hard to manipulate, hard to operate. This rifle has had close to 5,000 rounds through it now, and it's had some time to wear in, so it's a lot easier than it was to begin with, but it still was very, very hard to manipulate. Uh, but that was really the only uh, issue that I had had with it. So we're talking a little about the barrel on this one first, and then we're going to do a comparison between the AR-10 and the a, a and the AR-10B. We have a polymer brown handguard on here, which is very reminiscent of the original uh, Sudanese or Portuguese type AR-10s. Brownells had done some work on the front sight base to give us a more realistic and more, uh, you know, and a, and a more better rendition of what the original AR-10 front sight base will look like, and it's and it is also pinned in place. Now looking at the front sight base, you'll see that the front sight post is machined into the front sight post. So the elevation is adjustable from the from the rear, not the front. 
And we also have a machine here. It's very, very well made. The barrel we have on here, these barrels were manufactured by Fax and Firearms. And those of you who have had a chance to mess around with the Fax and Firearms barrels, these are probably some of the finest that are made right now. Uh, I have quite a bit of experience with those barrels. I have several rifles that have them on there. And they went to work with right now is to build a really excellent reproduction. We also have a three-prong flash suppressor, which is very accurate for this model as well. Now, the sling that I put on here is a regular GI sling. It's a regular M1, M14, early M16 style sling, which should also be proper. You also saw some leather slings at the time. So we're going to take a look at the left side. And what we can see here is we have a very, very uh, accurate rendition of the safety. You can see the dimple in the center, which had to do with the manufacturing. And we can see the paddle that we have on here as well for the uh, bolt release. Again, it was a very good rendition of the way that it was made. Looking on the right side here, we can see the dimple here as well. We also see the, the proper type of a magazine release. And we do have the proper um, you know, the proper uh, vertical serrations on the front and rear takedown pins. Now, one difference is, is the front pivot pin on this model. This is captive, where the original ones, this would, be, this would release. The bulk here, we're, we're going to take apart in a minute here. They did an excellent job on it as well. Right now, I want to talk a little bit about magazines. The first production rifles came with a Brownells manufactured aluminum magazine. Basically, this looks like a uh, 7.62 version of the standard uh, AR-15 magazine. This uh, was stopped production for some reason. Uh, I don't know why it was stopped. Uh, there were some mechanical issues, I guess, with it. Uh, but I probably had about a half a dozen of these, and I never had any issues at all. They changed that in favor of with a correct waffle pattern AR-10 type magazine. They did an absolute gorgeous job on these. Uh, the initial ones were more of a nitride black finish and they went to more of a parkerized finish. And all the rifles that uh, are manufactured currently come with these. Now some of the older rifles you see may still come with the original ones and most of the ones that were original all had the standard pistol grip, which you would also see. Uh, this particular rifle was one of the earlier rifles that I borrowed from Brownells. Uh, this came with both. We're going to take a look at the bolt carriers now. Charging handle just drops, comes from the inside, comes right out. Now, although this bolt carrier group is compatible with the standard AR-10 SR-25 type that we see out there today, they had done a lot of work on the cosmetics of it to make it a very much a, a, a clone of the original AR-10 bolt carrier group. We can see the shape that we have here, which is the shape of the original. Also, the outside here is flat. We have a nice uh, chrome plating finish on here. We do have the original machine firing pin retaining pin. Our firing pin. We have a chrome cam pin and the chrome bolt. Now the chrome bolt on here is man particle and proof tested uh, as it would have been the original. Now this bolt has had probably about 5,000 rounds through it and it has worked perfectly. The interesting thing about these uh, AR-10 type bolts is we don't normally see these things break. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen one break LMT, Knights, or any of them. And anytime I've traveled throughout the, throughout the world uh, and seen these rifles in use, I've never heard of an AR-10 uh, bolt breaking. Now, one of the modifications that they had done on this uh, to improve it is they have, have a rounded ejector on here. A rounded ejector uh, it increases chances of having any kind of failures to eject by anything getting caught by having the round ejector on there. Now, for as far as the bolt carrier is concerned, if any of these bolt components were to fail, you would be able to take uh, any factory standard AR-10, SR-25 type bolt carrier components and install it. Next thing I have to take a look at is the history of the rear sight. Now, the rear sight has a very interesting history to it that many of you probably do, uh, do, are not aware of. Now, the original rear sight, as you can see, we have a windage drum on here. Uh, that was correct for, the, for this time period. We also saw a little window in the rear. This little window here would give you your position for your elevation. Now, to adjust your, your windage, you would have a screw in here that you would loosen and you would move this manually. When we get into the 1980s, uh, Colt, uh, Colt engineer Hank Tatro developed an open bolt machine gun. And he wanted to have that for extended range. So he looked at the original AR-10, looked at the elevation of the, of the site. So he adopted the elevation knob 
of the AR-10 to his LMG. But he also had seen that the LMG that he wanted a better way of adjusting the, the windage. So he created a knob on the side that would move the move the, the rear aperture for uh, the, the windage. That would be carried over to the M16A2. So you can see the direct lineage of the original AR-10 with the elevation knob in the rear. And even with the uh, even with the window here on the original Colt Light machine gun, you had this window to see your position. Instead of having the position being shown on the left hand side, it was shown in the rear. But with the LMG, Colt Hank Tatro did do the development of the windage knob, and so you can sort of see a, uh, a history of the the M16A2's fully adjustable rear sight, and it did come directly from uh, the AR-10 rifle. Installation of the bolt carrier is the same as any. That's one thing that's never changed in any of the, the Colt uh, designs or the Armalite designs. The reassembly is very, very simple. Now, there were two models that were offered. What we have here is the BRN-10A, uh, which is the most popular one with the brown furniture. And we're going to be taking a look at the handguards and underneath the barrels in a, in a minute here. The other one, which has been less popular, has been the AR-10B. Now, the AR-10B is basically the black version uh, with the ears, with only being uh, one major difference is the barrel and the, and the muzzle device. The barrel on here is significantly lighter, uh, and we have a closed prong device. We're take a look at the barrels. Now, looking at the differences in the barrels between the BRN 10A and 10B, the BRN 10A utilizes a heavy barrel, and we can see the fluting on here as well, which is very indicative with the earlier models. And we can also see the front sight base that was created, that was to uh, bring back the original style of the BRN 10 or the original AR 10. We see a more of a pencil barrel on the outside, and we see a three prong flash suppressor. The BRN 10B utilizes a thinner, more pencil profile barrel with a birdcage flash presser. Now this does make a difference in the weight. When we look at the original BRN 10A, we're looking at 8.7 pounds uh, versus the 7.8 pounds you're gonna have of the BRN 10B. Now, when you look at the differences in the weights, I guess the only thing I would have liked to have seen was them swap out uh, the BRN 10A with the lightweight barrel and the BRN 10B with the uh, heavier barrel, but it doesn't really particularly matter because the only real difference is, is the color of the handguards. Let's say you, you wanted this to be a BRN 10B, I have to do is get the brown furniture for it. Now, another change that we noticed was in the handguards. All the handguards came as just polymer handguards. This particular one's black, but it came as the brown as well. Brownells had created a heat shield. The heat shield you would buy separately for 12 bucks for a set of two, and they would snap right into the handguards. This made a major difference when it came to firing for as far as the heat that was, that was produced by these barrels. Uh, I was definitely pleased to see this, and uh, you can add these to any of any you guys who currently own AR-10s. You can certainly go right to uh, Brownells and get these heat shields to snap right into your handguards. I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know shooting characteristics and shooting impressions of the rifle. I'm going to show you a video of a of a picture of me a while back shooting an original A and I uh, AR-10 rifle, uh, both on semi and fully automatic. And the thing that you want to take a look at when you see is the amount of recoil going into my shoulder. Uh, due to the fact that you're looking at eight pound rifles uh, with a, with such a heavy cartridge, you do get a significant amount of recoil. But due to the fact this is an inline construction, uh, the way the, the recoil hits you, it hits you right into your shoulder, and you'll be able to see that from this video.
So as you saw, it, you know, the rifle drove back quite a bit uh, just due to its lightweight and its heavier cartridge. And the exact same thing was found with the BRN-10 rifles. Uh, again, you're looking at eight, uh, eight to nine pound rifle, or seven to eight, seven. You're looking at seven to eight pound rifles, so you have a significant amount of recoil that's in them. However, it's fully manageable and they're and extremely uh, accurate. So we're going to show some footage of me firing this rifle for the first time uh, back in 2017, as well as some additional footage uh, firing it more recently. Now, the one characteristic I found with uh, this particular BRN-10, now I'm not sure if this is the same as all of them, the rifle seemed to be a little bit uh, under-gassed. Uh, it did not like 7.62 NATO ammunition. It liked the more powerful uh, 308 Winchester. The, the 7.62 NATO ammunition that I test was both with the P, was PPU uh, 7.62 NATO, uh, ZQI, as well as the uh, Lake City, the XM80. And we did have some failures uh, to cycle with those. However, when we used the uh, 308 Winchester, uh, whether it would be the, uh, the SIG, whether it would be American Eagle or uh, the Gecko, or also some of the newer Norma, it fired those you know, beautifully. So it tends to be these are, these are 308 chambers and they're designed for the the higher pressure ammunition, but that again could have been just this, this specific rifle. But using that ammunition, the uh, the rifles worked 100%. Uh, you know, accuracy we mostly shot steel uh, out to 100 to 200 yards with these, and there was no problem with it whatsoever. It's a, it does better than my eyesight will allow me to do. But the overall impressions are, you know, I absolutely love these rifles. You're looking at $12.99 for the price for the BRN-10A, and you're looking at $12.49 uh, for the most part for the BRN-10B. Uh, obviously, you're paying a little bit less for the you know, less barrel material. Um, they are still currently available, and I am very glad to see that Brownells is continuing to manufacture these, and they're continuing to be very, very uh, you know, much in demand. Now, I've seen a lot of content creators who have said, well, what they could have done differently, what they could have done differently, and I look at this very, very differently because I come from a manufacturing engineering background. What you're looking at here is a system that had to be recreated from the ground up. So when you manufacture something like this, you need to do it smart. Uh, you don't want to make an entire rifle that is proprietary, so the fact that there is any problems that you have specific parts you have to have. To be able to make a rifle uh, and bring it back to have it the original configuration, but still have some compatibility, so if any parts ever do go bad, that you're able to keep the gun and get it back into working order. So um, I will not criticize them for that whatsoever. The only thing that I think I could I would criticize would be the finish. Uh, I would prefer to see these come out in a charcoal gray finish, which is what they were supposed to be. Uh, Brownells was not able to do that. And this is one of the mysteries of the industry. 
is that uh, you know the charcoal gray finish was utilized for 30, 40 years, going back with the original AR-15s, AR-10s. Uh, you know they were done with the Armalite rifles. Uh, they've been used right up to this date. You know in rifles in uh, in Korea. You know in, in Dimaco, uh, Colt Canada used it right up until a few years ago. Why that it's so hard to find anodizers here who can do the charcoal gray uh, is is just amazing to me. Everybody can do the black, but they have a very, very hard time finding someone who can do that original charcoal gray. Uh, to my knowledge, the only company I know who, who can do it is, uh, well, there's one is Light Metals out of, uh, out of, out of Connecticut, and there's another one that's uh, U.S. Anodizing. And U.S. Anodizing does them for people like Nodex Spud and, you know, who do a beautiful job. But they only take large jobs, so it's hard to get companies to, to do it. But I don't know what's so magical about doing uh, the charcoal gray finish. But I will definitely say that's the only complaint that I really could have is, you know, I would have liked to have seen it in the proper finish. They've done all the proper attention to details on the pistol grip, on the, on the stock, on the sights. Uh, they did a beautiful job on the safety, the bolt catch, uh, the, the takedown pins. A uh, beautiful job on the bolt carrier with the chrome and having the original uh, look to it. Um, I think they did an awesome job, and I want to do a relook into it because, you know, for as far as the BRN-10B is concerned, I don't know if I've ever seen a review on it. Um, it's not nearly as, po as popular, and I think it's just because people like the original brown finish. Um, I do like the barrel on that, but uh, I have yet to see anybody who really would do a review on it. Um, but we're not going to do any shooting of that one. I had requested that from Brownells uh, as a loan, just so you guys could take a look and see that you know this this model is out there and it is available. It does have a lighter barrel. It's a very very handy rifle, and also because of the cost of these rifles, these are not safe queens. Mine rifle is not a safe queen. It's got about five thousand rounds through it. These are rifles that you can take out and shoot. And if you need a new barrel, you buy a new barrel. If you need a new bolt, you buy a new bolt. New firing pin, you buy a new firing pin. It's not something that you're gonna uh, not going to be able to replace parts on so it's something that you could take out and it's a really handy rifle it's probably the most lightweight uh, 762 rifle that I've seen out there and it's old school it's iron sights it's uh you know it's, it's foolproof uh, its reliability is very well established I think there was even a uh, in-range video where they did it did an endurance test on it throwing it in the mud and the thing came out perfect um, that's how this uh, this design is and uh, I definitely want to thank Brownells for taking the time and the effort to recreate such an iconic piece of history that uh, unfortunately Colt dropped the ball on back in the day and they never brought it back until the LE-901. Uh, and of course, that's nothing like it is today. But nobody has ever done anything like this. The closest you could get it was a parts kit that would come out of Portugal or, or somewhere, uh, and then it would come into the U.S., and then you would have a, a manufacturer who would make a lower receiver, a steel lower receiver or whatever, and build it off an original parts kit. Well, if you were to find something like that, you're looking at well over five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000. And those original uh, A&I parts, those original AR-10 parts, if you, if you break something, that's it. Those are not compatible with the parts that you see here. So getting one of those is totally impractical if you want to have a shooter. Um, this takes care of all those. It gives you a good price and gives you a rifle that you can shoot. So I hope you all do enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.